Hello and welcome. I'm Jamie Hopkins, and today I'm joined with two experts here, uh, David Littell from the American College and Bill Borden, who is the managing principal at uh, W.R. Borden Associates. So thank you both for being here. Thank you, Jamie. Very Delighted much. to be here. Yeah. So uh, really, Bill, we're, we're here to talk about you right now, which is uh, your practice. You build a really interesting practice that focuses on retirement and retirement income planning. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what does your practice look like? Well, I am a life and health producer for almost 35 years. And uh, when it occurred to me, after struggling in the employee benefits space uh, by the end of 2010, that it wasn't going to get any easier or any more fun uh, given the economy and the Affordable Care Act, that I needed to find another way. And so I took a look around, uh, read Flash Foresight by Daniel Burris, and looked at the trends. Mm -hmm. And I saw the oldest baby boomers turning 65. And I thought, hmm, there's an area here where people are being underserved and where there's a large number of people that I could work with uh, if I could figure out how to do it. And so I decided to focus on long-term care planning and insurance for high net worth baby boomers. Okay. And I define high net worth you know, for general purposes as a million to five million of invested assets. Mm -hmm. Some of my clients have less, some have more, but that's the sweet spot. Okay. And so uh, I got in uh, in the middle of 2011 was when I launched my, my firm. Mm -hmm. And that was around the time when the big guys were all getting out of selling new long-term care policies. The headlines in the newspapers were about the horrific rate increases on existing policies, and nobody wanted to talk. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> that, you know? Long-term yeah. care, oh no, no, happens new. So, uh, but I also knew that uh, I needed to be able to gain access to high net worth mm -hmm. clients. And a high net worth baby boomer, if they're smart, is not trying to do everything on their own. They're working with different advisors. They have some sort of financial advisor, probably, mm -hmm. someone that does their taxes, almost certainly, and they may have drafted some documents over the way, over the years with a, an advisor, a legal advisor. They may not be current, they may not be sufficient, but they've done something. And so I deemed myself uh, a fourth leg to that stool, that advisor stool, and said, I'm going to help them manage the long-term care risk. Mm -hmm. But in order to gain access to these people, I knew I had to find how to reach them. Right. And so I thought, well, of the three advisors, the investment advisor, if there's someone that I can collaborate with, would be the best source of not just initial, but an ongoing source of prospective clients. And so I was reminded uh, that there are two basic forms of financial advisor, the registered representative yeah. that adheres to the suitability standard, and the registered investment advisor, which is a fiduciary and has mm -hmm. the best interest standard. And so I knew that the fee-only registered investment advisors, which is most of them, right. don't sell or manage insurance products. So I thought, hmm, they need me. <laughs> the folks who are registered representatives either have insurance licenses or have someone in their firm or their company that mm -hmm. does, and they would consider me to be irrelevant or competition. Yeah. And so I sought out uh, the registered investment advisors in the Philadelphia area typically that had 300 to 500 million of assets under management, up to several billion. Okay. And so I started reaching out to them through colleagues uh, that I had that I knew using LinkedIn and as a member of what was then the Greater Philadelphia Senior Executive Group that I was on the board of. I was getting a lot of help from a lot of people. And so I started meeting with fee-only RIAs mm -hmm. and imagine the fact that they weren't overwhelmed <laughs> with admiration to see me. You know, they, many of them are what I call burn victims. They had had previously unpleasant experiences working with insurance mm -hmm. people. Uh, they knew there was a need. They weren't sure how big the need was or how frequent that it would be. But gradually over time, a number of them started to warm to me and started to introduce me to their clients. And guess what? It worked out well for everybody. <laughs> and so we continued doing it. I also uh, went after a number of the boutique accounting firms in the mm -hmm. area and also talked to some elder law attorneys and estate planning attorneys. But the, by far, the fee-only RIAs were the largest source of clients. Uh, and today, about 50% of my clients come to me from uh, fee-only advisors. Okay. And so uh, over time, though, I started getting phone calls with questions about other things. 
because when that know, like, and trust exists, mm -hmm. people say, well, hmm, maybe Borton knows about this or that. So I started getting calls about Medicare because an accountant or an advisor had someone that was halfway uh, in their 64th year. They're starting, they got their Medicare right. card in the mail. Mm -hmm. They're starting to get all these official looking mm -hmm. mailers uh, and they're calling their accountant or their advisor and saying, what do I do? Yeah. And of course they don't know. And so, well, gee, maybe Bill knows. So Bill had to get up to speed on Medicare in a hurry. And of course I did. Uh, then a year or so later, I had some colleagues, friends, clients that started asking me about annuities. Either they had been to one of the educational dinner seminars or they were uh, leaving their company either intentionally or not so intentionally, had a 401k that all of a sudden everybody wanted to help them with. And so they called me and said, Bill, what, 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 what are these annuities? What are these uh, fixed indexed annuities? What are these income riders? How does this stuff work? Is this something I should be doing? So of course, I then had to learn all about annuities as quickly as I could. And so I started thinking, hmm, what am I really doing here? I'm actually manage, managing risk. And along the way, I started really paying attention to a lot of sources of information, including the American College and the RICP program, and saw that there were 18 risks in, environment, in, in retirement that you know, people could have to deal with. Some of them certainly, some of them only possibly. And then I took a look at these risks and I said, which ones of these can I help manage? And I took a look at longevity and long-term care and health care and sequence of returns and things like that. And I said, there's things that I can do to help in these areas. And so I coined the phrase retirement risk manager. So I started calling myself yeah. that. <laughs> that's so. great. So yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting way, right, to kind of supplement what the team of people are doing in retirement income planning, that you're really adding on that specialty about retirement risk management, which mm -hmm. I think is a really great idea. Yeah, I think it's uh, an interesting way to build a practice, too, because, uh, you know, we, I think a lot of people are thinking that the advisor is going to end up doing everything. And it's really hard, and it's really complicated. And if you go through our RECP program, we, we learn that, like how much is involved. So working with someone who's handling assets while you're doing the, the risk management part makes a lot of sense to me and, and maybe of interest to other advisors building pra a practice. Well, I hope so. You know, we're living in an age of specialization and we have for quite some time and part of the reason for that is the internet. Mm -hmm. And generalists generally uh, do a lot of things maybe adequately but not really well. And so, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, last year I studied for and then passed the 65 and the beginning of 2017 I formed my own RIA and so WR Borton Advisors now exists although I kinda keep that quiet because I don't manage money mm -hmm. I don't want to manage money because again I'm not a specialist in that area but what I do is I partner with the other fee only RIAs and they now look at me differently than they did before mm -hmm. they see me more as a peer and also, I'm legally now able to talk about moving money uh, from securities to annuity products. And I'm a big believer that a portion of someone's retirement income should be guaranteed. And that in addition to Social Security, unless you're lucky enough to have a pension, you need some annuity income. But you don't need 80 to 100% of your invested <laughs> assets in an income yeah. annuity. So, so do you have you know, one or two pieces of advice that you would give to anyone looking to specialize, right? in the retirement income field? Well, first of all, uh, I signed up and am enrolled in the RICP mm -hmm. program, and I know that most people watching this have already done so as well. But again, if you're going to be in a business, you need to be in the business. You need to specialize. You need to show everyone, show the world that you're serious about what you're doing. Also, being independent is important. I'm not a career agent with any company. I'm a, I have brokerage agreements with probably 30 insurance carriers. Mm -hmm. And so people like independence and objectivity. That's what the fee-only RIAs talk about. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm going to collaborate with fee-only, objective, independent people, I need to be that way as well. Okay. Well, yeah, that's a great story. And thanks for uh, coming in and talking to us about how you built your practice, how you got there, and a little bit of advice for those looking to specialize in this area. Thank you, Jamie. This video was made possible by the New York Life Center for Retirement Income.